Good morning. It's good to see each of you here. You know, it's kind of crazy times. It's still not anything like it used to be as far as the crowds and things, but we're just glad that you're here. For those that are listening in from home, we're glad that you're able to listen in and join us in worship this morning. Um, I'll have a prayer as we begin our worship, and then I'll, as normal, I'll come back up at the end with some announcements about some of our sick that we need to remember in prayer and other announcements that we might have. So if you would, bow with me. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity, Father, for the good health that we all have to come here and worship you this morning, Father. Father, my prayer is that as we enter into this worship now, Father, that our minds can be focused on you and your Son, that we can be reminded as we sing songs of praise, as we hear your word proclaimed, Father, of the love that you had for us by the sending of your Son to shed his blood for us. Father, we're grateful for this church family. We ask that you continue to be with us all as we strive to continue to fellowship and love with love one another, Father. Father, as we worship you this morning, again, uh, help us focus. Help us have our minds on what we're, we're doing, Father, as we honor you and glorify you and praise you this morning. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done, Father, so continue to be with us and help us to do all we can to show you that we're yours this morning. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Number 286. 286, Living by Faith. I care not today what the morrow may bring
number 249. 249. Time is filled with swift transition. Not a birth on who can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand.
Our next song this morning will be 316, 316.
496. 496. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall be on that beautiful shore. In the sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, 
they might live in the Spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for just giving us the health and the opportunity and the means to be able to come and worship you on this first day of the week. Specifically, Lord, we're mindful of what's going on in this country, and we really just ask that we're able to find a cure, number one, and that likewise that as a result of this that more people will analyze their faith with you or lack of and hopefully grow stronger as a result of what's going on, Lord, and grow closer to the church. We pray for the ones this morning who are not able to be here for sick reasons. We know there are ones going through procedures and surgeries and recovering. We ask that you be with each one of them and their needs. We'll be with, we ask you to be with the two families that have lost loved ones in the past month or so. We ask you to continue to show your love and your mercy towards them. And Lord, uh, we just ask you to go through with us this morning as the word is delivered from Brother Gary, and we just ask you to help him to focus on the things that we need to hear, and help us to have attentive ears and learn how to apply it to our lives. And above all, I just pray that we're merciful to each other and try to serve you and serve one another. In Christ's name, amen. We'll be using a psalm book this morning and want to mark the invitation song. It will be number 700, 700. And before our lesson, we'll sing B85. B85 in our folders. You will please stand. Science calls sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us lift to the fall of love. Science calls and dreams, coming from the throne above. While we hear
Good morning. What a joy to be here. And I want to tell you what, this is a little bit different day. Because I've already assembled with uh, more than 30 brethren downstairs just a little while ago. And I want you to think about this for just a minute. When we were in uh, Valdosta, I think of that in particular, uh, there was a sweet woman in her 90s who is no longer able to get out. Early on, when I was there, we began to video the entire worship service. And uh, different Christians, two or three, four, would go and take those videos to her house. And they would sit and they would worship with her with that video. They would... They would Pray with her as she took the Lord's Supper and things like that. Was it the ideal? No. Did Miss Thelma want to be with us? Yes. That's easy. She did. But it worked. It was a way for her to participate in worship. Now, if you don't like the way this is right now, the way we're divided like we are, I'm going to tell you how to fix it. And I'm dead serious. Everybody wear a mask. I mean everybody. He said, well, we live in a land of freedom. We can make a choice. Yeah, we do live in a land of freedom. You know what? We also live as citizens of heaven. And you know what citizens of heaven do? Citizens of heaven worry about each other. You thought about that? I think we need to be thinking about it. Because there, are, there ain't anybody that was down there today that doesn't want to be up here. Not one person. So what's holding them back? Sometimes me. Okay? I'm not, I'm not pointing any fingers. I'll say, I, I've done it. Okay? Now the good news is they actually let me get up there and take my mask off way up front like this. <laughs> so, that, so that I could preach. But just think about it, please. I'm not angry with anybody. I'm just, let's just think about it, okay? What's the loving thing to do? Do I like math? No. Does it give me a headache? Absolutely. Every, I've got one right now. Because I've spent the best part of the last hour with one. But you know what? I'll take a headache every Sunday to be with my brethren. Every Sunday. What about you? Just think about it. Well... Can you imagine what it would be like? Oh, I think you can. For people to be hateful, mean, and destructive, and hurtful. Literally hurting people because they take a view that you don't agree with. Can you imagine living like that? Did you know that's exactly the circumstance that Peter wrote under? Exactly. Only it was worse than what you might have been imagining. You may be thinking about today, I'm thinking about back then. When Peter wrote to the scattered Christians around the world, he wrote to people who were suffering for their faith. And I don't just mean suffering like we sometimes, I mean suffering. Stephen, James, at least, those two we know had been killed already by the time this letter was written, this letter of 1 Peter. But they weren't the only ones to die. Many died for their faith. Many were put to death for their faith. Is it tempting to quit? Is it tempting to say, I'm not going to be faithful anymore because I don't want to suffer? I'd say, yes. That is a temptation. I think it's real. And because of that reality, Peter wrote about living faithfully. And he starts it by talking about the way we are. Listen to him. We already heard it read. And by the way, Owen did a great job, not just with the reading. By the way, I want to know what translation that is, but that's that's for later. It was accurate. Don't don't misunderstand me. I just picked up on a few words. I thought, I'd like to check that out. You know, a couple of those words, because I've already looked up all those definitions. They, They matched up. 
But he also did a good job with the prayer, praying, praying for many who are in various forms of need. And I appreciate that. And for me as well. But listen, go back to that verse 1. Listen to what he says. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Twice in that verse, you, you see a form of the word suffer, don't you? In fact, if you were to look this up, you're going to discover that the word suffer, suffered, or suffering, something like that occurs 18 times in the short book of 1 Peter. 18 times. Five chapters. 18 times. Do you think he had it on his mind? I think he did. And for good reason. They were suffering. But as he thought about it, he could not help but think about what Christ did for us. And go back just briefly to what we looked at before. Verse 18 of chapter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Christ suffered. Now, let me, let me say this up front. I may not suffer today for doing something wrong, but I have done things wrong. Is there anybody in here that can honestly say, if you're old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, can you honestly say, I've never done anything wrong? Well, if you think you can honestly say that, you need to reread Scripture because it doesn't agree with us. Scripture says that all sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Of course, of course I've done wrong. I may not be suffering today for what I did wrong, but I could have suffered for what I did wrong. But Jesus, he never did anything wrong. But he suffered anyway. Why? The just for the unjust. He suffered for me. And for that reason, notice that the, Peter, the Apostle Peter says, arm yourselves. That's a funny word, arm. Well, think about going to war. If you were going to war, what would you take with you? Wouldn't you want to put on the right armament, maybe the right helmet on your head? Wouldn't you want to be sure that you had the right weapon? Wouldn't you want to be sure that you had plenty of ammunition? So that you can go to war, that's arming yourself. For the Christian, the way we arm ourselves, the way we prepare to face life on a daily basis is that we take up the mind of Christ. That we think like he thought. He was willing to suffer to do the Father's will. And that's exactly what Peter's talking to us about. In fact, Notice verse 2, and I want to read the end of verse 1 again so that we're sure we understand what we're talking about here. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Peter's writing to suffering saints. I don't think there's a question about that. I think that's as clear as a bell, isn't it? 18 times, word suffer or suffering, some form of it. He's writing to suffering saints. As he writes to those suffering saints, what does he say? He says, if you're suffering because you're doing what's right, here's the good news. And that good news is very simple. You're living for God. And that's the beauty of it. That's the goal of it. That's the challenge of it. You see, that's why Jesus died and what, why we ought to live like we live. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for instance, where the Apostle Paul, in, in writing to those brethren at Corinth, says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why did Jesus go to the cross? Was he a masochist? He just loved to get hurt. No. He was not a masochist. Why did he go? 
so that we could be the righteousness of God. If I really am going to live for Jesus, I need to live right. Righteousness, according to the psalmist, Psalm chapter 119, righteousness is following the will of God in all that I do. Now, honestly, there are days when I struggle with that. I suppose we all do. But that's the goal. That's the way we are as Christians. But then Peter wants to remind us briefly of the way we were. Listen to him in the very next verse, verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. Walk, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And right here is when I wish I had you know, uh, Owen's Bible up here because it defines several of those. Let me go through those with you and let's look at them. T take that first word, lewdness. When Wayne Jackson looked at that, he said it's outrageous conduct, including sexual perversion. Outrageous conduct. I'll say. The sexual revolution in the United States of America, at least this time around, began in the 1960s. And I'm going to contend it hadn't stopped. That it's getting worse. It's outrageous what some people do. You know, it used to be that one particular group identified themselves with two letters. Now they've got at least four letters and a plus sign on the end. What does the plus sign mean? I don't even think I want to know. Because all the other letters are bad. Every one of them is bad. It's around us. We've got to be careful as Christians. We've got to be look out because there's a temptation out there to, to be accepted in the eyes of other people. And to do that, we might be tempted to go off in the direction they've gone. Don't do that. That's the way we were, not the way we are. But then he goes on from lewdness to lusts. Lust here is base desires. And really, it's desire out of control. There's nobody here that doesn't have desire. And see, you know, I've already preached once today. Let me tell you something. I've got a great desire to go home and take this shirt off. I'm getting hotter by the second. <laughs> and then I want to eat. I have a desire to eat. Those that know me know, no, you've got a desire right now to eat. Well, that's true, but let's not talk about that, okay? That's not the point. We've all got desires, don't we? The word here, lust, is desire out of control. Just let it run wild. And if you look around you in the world, that's what's going on with sinful people. Desires just run wild. Just do whatever you want to do, whatever makes you feel good, do it. That's the idea that they set forth. Then drunkenness, I don't think I need to define that. I figure most people got that one figured out. Drunkenness. Revelries. Revelries are riotous parties. And you, you, maybe you're thinking right now about you know, those parties you may have seen images of on college campuses where they just are doing all sorts of all kind of wild things. Let me tell you, it's not just college campuses. We moved to Mobile, Alabama back in 1981. And when we arrived in Mobile, Alabama, two weeks every year were devoted to wild partying. They, and you know what? They even put it, it was headlines on the paper. You know, ignorant, uh, naive, you know, Gary and Teresa with little Nathan. One of the members invited us. Said, do you want to go with our family in Mardi Gras? Yeah, I guess so. It's just a parade, right? <laughs> Woo, let me tell you. No, no, no. It's a way more than any parade. It ain't nowhere a Christian. Need. I never went again. But how embarrassed was I when the next morning the newspaper said, streets of Mobile fill with over 100,000 revelers. That's biblically wrong. And I was smack dab in the middle of it. 
Now, I didn't do what some of them did, but I was embarrassed. It's going on. It's around us. We've got to be aware of it. And then he specifies drinking parties. We, we probably would put this drinking binges. And when I think of a binge, again, my, my mind you know, thinks about college campuses where they get in those drinking competitions, see who can drink the other one under the table. Did you know every so often in the news, there's a report of a young man or a young woman that got into one of those drinking binges just to prove how smart they were and how great they were, and they die of alcohol poisoning. That's how much they ingest in a short span of time. Peter says, that's been going on a long time. It's not right, but it's been going on. And then he says, abominable idolatries. And that word literally describes religious ceremonies involving drunkenness and orgies. And what we need to understand is that in that era, the worship of false gods was often wrapped up in both things. Consumption of alcohol and sexual perversion was a part of it. In fact, if you think about the, the city of Corinth, they say that at one point in their history, there were a thousand temple prostitutes that served in Corinth. And when you went into the prostitute, you were worshiping the God. Oh, my. Well, you say, well, I'm glad we don't live in an era. We don't. Oh, they may not claim to be following a certain God, but what have they done? They've made their own pleasure their God. Haven't they? And do they do these same kind of thing? Yeah, they do. Now, it's worshiping at the idol of self-service and self-pleasure. That's true. But it's still wrong. And it's the way we were before we became part of the body of Christ. Verse 4 of First Peter chapter 4, he goes on, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Now see, when we change from being an unbeliever to a believer, from being a, a person focused on self to a person focused on God, the folks around us think we're kind of odd. You're kind of strange, aren't you? A little bit different. Yeah. Why? Because you don't run with the same flood. By the way, that word flood, I looked it up. That's the best definition you could put here. It means overflowing. Just imagine for a moment a, a dam that breaks and the water just rushing down the, rushing down the valley. That's kind of the idea here. But this is a flood of... Now I, I'm going to be honest with you, Owen. I don't like your definition. I don't like mine either. Dissipation, debauchery, what do either one of them mean? I don't know. So I looked it up, and you know what the word, best word I found for it? Abandon. Abandon all reason. Give up all thought of law. Put it all aside and live like you want to live. And you might say, don't know it. Oh, you haven't been watching the news. People acting like there's no such thing as law. No respect for any authority at all. And it's not limited. You, know, you may be thinking it is. I've seen the pictures, friends. It's not limited to one race or another, one group or another. There are a bunch of folks living like there's no law. And it's dangerous. People are dying because of it. Little children have been killed because of it. Yes, that's the way they live. Out of control, with abandon. A flood going down a canyon, so to speak, because the dam broke. That's the lifestyle that we were part of. And they think we're oddballs because we don't go with them. Why don't we go? 
because judgment is sure. That's what Peter says. Judgment, sure. Listen to him. Verse 5, when he goes on to say, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, when I was growing up, you know what I thought about when I thought about judgment? I thought about God's going to judge us. And there's a sense in which that would be true. In fact, there are two senses that would be true. Jesus is God, number one. Number two... Uh, the Father has appointed him to do it, so in that sense, he's, he's judging me too. I could say it that way. But the reality is that God has ordained Jesus to be the judge. And you look at the book, for example, Romans chapter 2, verse 16, where the Apostle Paul uh, tells us, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. God will judge. And he's not just going to judge what everybody knows about me. A lot of us are real protective and careful. We don't let anybody know what we do in secret and in private. But the truth is, in judgment, we're going to be judged on the totality of our lives. I mean, look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, where Paul says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Everybody's going to reap what they sow. That's what he said. Now someone might say, I don't know, I don't like this idea of judgment. Because in the world, they've seen that certain people go in the courtroom and seem like they get preferential treatment. That may actually be true. I, I don't know about what happens in human courtrooms. But just in case you think that might happen in eternity, look back just a few verses, Romans chapter 2, this time verse 11. For there is no partiality with God. Doesn't matter how much money you had. Doesn't matter who you knew or who you were. It's how you lived. God's not partial. Everybody will be judged the same. Now, because we know judgment is sure, what kind of life should we live? Well, not that life we used to be in, but instead this new life. So he goes on in verse 6, 1 Peter 4, and he says, For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now, dead, dead. Gospel was preached to the dead. There are two possibilities here, and I even wonder if Peter didn't mean both. Okay, possibility number one. The dead are those dead in sin. Think Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you have the made alive, or you have the quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Why do we preach the gospel to people that are lost? Because they're dead in sin. And we want them to live for God. That's why. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that he's talking about people who now are dead, but when we preached them, they weren't dead. And why do we preach to them? Because we wanted them to realize it doesn't matter how men judge you. What really matters is how God will judge you. Change your life, please. I think he could have meant both. We preach the gospel to get people who one day will die and who currently are dead spiritually. We preach the gospel so that they'll be prepared for what? The judgment that's coming. The very thing he talked about in this passage. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, the Apostle Paul uh, talks about these things in, in this way. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Look out about how you think 
about self, how proud we are of ourselves. Now, Peter and Paul are on the same page because listen to verse 7 of what Peter has to say. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. The end of all things is at hand. That's a tough one. Do you remember Matthew chapter 3? What, what did Peter preach? Peter. How about John the Baptist? Would be all right if I moved him back there. That's probably his chapter, right? Okay, what did John the Baptist preach? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It basically means right around the corner, basically. When you go to Matthew chapter 4, I believe it's verse 17, how does Jesus preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right around the corner. Okay, would it surprise you to know that basically Peter's using the same word here? So, what happened? Because the end, I mean, we're 2,000 years later, the end hadn't come. Right? Well, wait a minute. Yes, the end did come. Now, I'm not talking about the Lord's already come back, so don't, don't go there. I do know some people that do I say that, but biblically that's not accurate. That's not correct. But the end of the Jewish system was at hand. The destruction of Jerusalem was right around the corner. In AD 70, which is just a few months or at most a couple of years away from when Peter wrote, in AD 70, Titus, the Roman general, was going to surround uh, the city of Jerusalem. He's going to lay siege to it. Josephus says over a million people died in the ensuing siege and war or battle that followed. And it wasn't much of a battle because the Jews weren't ready to face those Roman troops. The end is at hand. So, so, get ready. Get ready. That's the idea that he has here. In fact, the way he puts it is what? Be serious. Now remember, we've already seen that word in Romans 12. Be serious. You, you ever work with somebody who, I mean, I don't know, they couldn't be serious under any circumstance. But I don't know about you, I think there are certain situations where it's important to be serious. Let's say you and I are working together and I'm kind of holding the board or the log, and you're holding the chainsaw. I would like you to be serious. Do you understand why? You cutting up and carrying on, somebody, somebody may get cut up and carried on. Now, I don't want to be that person. Right? There's a time to be serious. There's a time to be focused. And when Peter talks about the end is at hand, the end of the Jewish system, it was time for Christians to be serious, to get focused. How are you going to do it? Be watchful. There are mamas in this audience, I suspect, who have a little two-way radio system. One end of that radio, and it's turned on, is in the children's bedroom, especially the baby. And the other end is in mama's bedroom. How fast can mama get out of bed if she hears something wrong? Faster than I can think about it, I can tell you that much. She'll be down that hall before I can get out of the bed. That's the idea of watchful here. Alert, tuned in, listening and watching for any problem. Now, how are we going to do that? He says, in prayer. Watchful in prayer. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm not expecting anybody else to. But if you ask for a show of hands today, everybody that's ever allowed their prayer life at some point in time to slip to where they barely prayed at all, I'd have to raise my hand. I'm not proud of it, but it's true. The only time I prayed in, in those times was, for the most part, it's when trouble came. Talk to God now. <laughs> you know, this is when I need Him. <laughs> well, that's not the idea of watchful, is it? 
I'm thankful to say that for the time being, my prayer life's improved a little bit. I pray every morning as I walk. About 30 minutes, I pray. And I, because I'm praying that long, I, I get to think of a lot of names. You know, Kathy and Dennis, every day, every day, as I walk. They're in my list. They're not alone. I can name a whole bunch more if you'd like me to. Watchful in prayer. But not just praying for them. I'm praying for our shepherds. They need it. I'm not talking because they're bad. I'm talking about because, can you imagine trying to make decisions in a climate like this? I cannot. I don't want to be part of that. I don't have a desire to be an elder, but I've sat in the meetings and I've listened to them. They're in agony because of what's going on. And the choices they have to make. And I don't think they like any choice they've made yet, to be honest. But pray for them, brethren. Pray for them. We need them to watch for our souls, don't we? I know I do. Stand guard in prayer. That's the way Peter said. Paul put it differently, but didn't he really point to the same thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, when he says, pray without ceasing. Don't ever stop. Make it a constant in your life. I'm trying to do better at that. Because I need to stay on guard. I need to be ready. Judgment's sure. And because it's sure, I need to live faithfully. That's what Peter goes to next. Listen to him as he goes to verse 8. He says, uh, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Fervent. When Reinecker defines that word, he uses these two words, strenuous, intense. And I don't know what you think about when you think about that, but I think about uh, Granny. I think about Granny with the grandchildren. And they come to her and she goes, mm, mm, mm. That's that strenuous, intense love that we need to have for right now. For who? For the brethren. For our family. We're family, folks. We're family. We need to have an intense love for one another. That's a part of living faithfully as defined here. And you know what the beauty of it is? When we have that intense love, it'll cover sin. Whoa, wait a minute. How does it do that? Well, turn back. Just one book. The book of James. James chapter 5. It's the last two verses of his little epistle. Listen to what he says. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, how do we do that? Well, let me tell you this. I can't cover sin. But if you and I help people, help one another... When we're struggling with sin, if we help each other to turn back to God, guess what God does? He covers the sin up so he can't see it anymore. That's a pretty, pretty good image, isn't it? That's, a, that's an exciting image to me. When I'm living faithfully, I love the brethren enough that I will go to them. When they are struggling with sin, I will go to them and strive to bring them back so that when they come back, God will cover up their sins. But living faithfully doesn't stop there, does it? Peter keeps going. Look at what he says in verses 9 and 10. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I'm afraid that we've lost a little bit of the concept of hospitality, and I'll explain why, at least in part. In that era, there was no Holiday Inn Express. Okay? I'm, I know I shouldn't have named one brand, but you know what I mean. There were no motels in that era. If you, needed, if you went somewhere and you were a stranger there, you needed somebody to take you in. 
Now, sometimes people would pay and they'd stay at the inn. You know, we talk about Joseph and Mary, no room at the inn. Well, it, it likely was just somebody's house that rented out rooms. So it's likely what it was. It wasn't an inn like we think about inns. And so in that era, when Christians traveled, and remember now, they were persecuted, they were troubled, they were suffering. When Christians travel, what's the best place to stay? In a brother's house. In a brother's house. Because the brother's going to treat me right. Well, we may not have a whole lot of opportunities to do that, but if you read the whole and keep going, what else is he talking about? He said, use what you have to help your brethren. Now, that we've got. If you know a brother that has need, let me tell you a true story. Heard about this in the last few days. Some women have found out about a family that with all this stuff going on is, is struggling to be able to eat. And so these women have just resolved that they're going to take turnabout and at least once a week, they're going to feed that family a really good meal. That's using what you have to the glory of God. That's the point. What do you have? What do I have that we could use? Could you give somebody a ride in your car to the doctor? Could you go sit with somebody while their loved one of many, many years is having surgery? I know right now some of these things are more difficult. I'm fully aware of it. It's killing me. Because I'm used to going and being with people. I'm not getting to do that. When they're going through hard times, can you send a text? Can you send an email? Can you drop a card in the mail? You know, there's one individual, I guarantee you, I, I, if I forgot my anniversary that's coming up, I wouldn't have to worry about it because I'll get a card from this sweet, sweet sister two days ahead of time and I have plenty of time to get ready. She's constantly on it about that. I'm only using her as an example. Can, you, can we do that? Can you make a phone call? Use what you have to the glory of God. That's the way that we live faithfully. John talks about it. In the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verse 17, when he says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? And you know, the implication is it doesn't. <laughs> He's got it. He won't share it. The love of God's not in him. God had it. In the form of His Son, He shared Him on the cross of Calvary, and aren't we glad? Praise God that He did that. Living faithfully means using what we have to the glory of God. And, look at verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers... And do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. We've got the oracles of God. You know what an oracle was? It's just the words of the God. That's all it is. Now that's a little g, usually. But when Peter uses it, he's talking about the words of God, the Bible. We got it, don't we? We can deliver the Bible. We can carry that to people. Now, somebody might say, you know what? I'm not a good teacher. Let me tell you a true story. It happened one week ago today. Okay? How many people normally watch our worship service on a Sunday? Well, it's about 200. Am I roughly right, Derek? I think I was. About 200 normally. Last Sunday, I asked you, Everybody that has Facebook, go home and share the worship. That's all you got to do. Can you do that? You don't have to teach. You don't have to say one word to anybody. Just share it. Now, if you make a good comment, that helps too. <laughs> that picks it up too. Makes it pop. But I said, everybody go home and share it. You know how many people did it? Twelve. 
12 people. Now, one of them had two accounts and they shared on two. <laughs> but 12 people shared it. How many people viewed our worship service last Sunday? Remember, 200 is normal during all of this. How many watched last Sunday? Almost 800. And only 12 shared it. Brethren, we got to get busy. The Lord's given us tools like no generation has ever had before. We got to get busy. We got to use what we have. We got to share the word. We got to minister as we have opportunity. Okay, maybe you can't proclaim the word of God, but can you share the proclamation of the word of God? We got all kinds of good things coming out of this place. All kinds of teaching. Our Bible class. Did you listen to Richard's class yet? I cheated. I listened last night. But anyway, <laughs> it was great. It's a good, good, good study. Share it with people. Share, you know, what Jason does. Share what, what Derek does. Share it. It's the Word. The Word's not going to... It's going to have production. Isn't it? In the lives of people. And if we're living faithfully, we're going to take advantage of what we have. Don't you love Peter? They were hurting. They were suffering 18 times. Suffer. In one little book. So we wanted to remind them, here's the way you are now. Now you were something else. But because judgment is sure, you made a change. And as a result, I encourage you, live faithfully. In this audience, there may be some people that never took it up to begin with. You've not started that faithful life. If so, Peter in Acts chapter 2 gives a pretty easy way to make the change. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the mission of your sins. That's pretty easy. You can do it. Anybody can do it. Most of us here today are already Christians. We've already done that part. But have we struggled? Has our faith been weaker than it needs to be? Are there areas where I need God to forgive me because I wasn't as good in prayer as I ought to have been? For example, I've already told you that. The good news is the brethren can help cover up your sin. All you got to do is ask for everybody to pray for you. Whatever your need is right now, live faithfully. Come while we sing.
to help prepare our minds this morning before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 449. <clears throat> 449. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came through and sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved today we come to worship God and as part of our worship we partake of the Lord's Supper we partake of the bread it represents the body of Christ. We take the fruit of the vine that represents his blood that he shed so freely for our sins. The life of Jesus that was lived was a perfect life. And that perfect life is what made him, uh, being God's son, be the perfect sacrifice. You see here that God sent his son because he loves us. And Jesus died on the cross because he loves us. That through him, we have an opportunity to come to him because of his death, burial, and resurrection. And this morning, as we think about his death, as we think about his body, as we think about his blood, we think about a Savior who willingly went to that cross so that we would have an opportunity to live. Let us pray as we pray for the bread. Our most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day and for all that you do. Lord, God, guard and protect us, dear Lord, and just help us to always focus on you, dear Lord. And as we take of this bread at this time, dear Lord, help us take with a ready heart. Help us take, dear Lord, with a, a soul that is prepared before you, dear Lord, that is holy before you. Lord, God, guard and protect us, and in Christ's name we pray.
as we continue thinking about Jesus and the cross and his death on the cross, we think about his blood. And here we have the cup before us this morning, the fruit of the vine. And as we take of this, we are thinking about that loving Savior. We're thinking about what he went through. What he went through in the pain that was for his body. Through that pain that brought about the blood. One of the final things you see of Jesus on that cross was actually that spear being shoved into his side. That blood and water pouring forth. We take of this fruit of the vine to remember the blood that was shed for our sins. Let's pray. Our most kind gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, the Lord, for all that you do. Lord, we thank you for sending your Son. We thank you for the death of Jesus on the cross. Lord, we know that, that we deserve death. That we deserve death for our, for our sins and that Jesus took our place. Lord, as we think about that this morning and we focus on you, Lord, help us to take your Lord with a heart prepared before you. In Christ's name we pray. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Before we have uh, the closing prayer and the prayer for our giving this morning, just want you to take the opportunity to maybe look at your sheet with me. Uh, we want to remember, continue to remember these in our prayers, the Mac Adams and, and Jameson fa uh, families and their loss. Certainly continue to rem remember them. I know as time goes, the, their names come off the list, and but they're still... Uh, mourning their losses, so let's uh, let's continue to keep these families in our prayers. Loretta Ellis um, with her neck and back, and Jennifer Griffith with her sur upcoming surgery. H.D. Hood spoke to him last week. He uh, seems to be doing pretty well, but still has some issues that we need to pray for. And Alice King in the hospital, and Patricia, Patricia Liddell's father, who had a stroke, is in a nursing home. Those are dangerous, dangerous places these days. Nursing home seems. Uh, continue to pray for Terrell and the whole Morris and Carr family. Uh, Terrell with his health problems. Buddy, uh, there is some plans to try to get him home. But Vicky's at home sick and so is uh, Hillary. So that produces a problem for them. So pray for that. The, again, the Oxley and Carr family, keep them in your prayers. And Loretha Wallace. And there's a new one on here. Uh, Morgan's grandmother, Faye Britt, was diagnosed with cancer. And that family is very worried about her. Uh, also, the mother of Jessica Boyd, keep her in a prayer. Uh, the, the, the cancer's returned. And uh, Claude Roberts came to us this morning and said Laverne is at home, and we're glad of that. He's getting some help from the nurses to come by each week and help with Laverne. So uh, it's kind of a difficult time, particularly for Claude, have, trying to take care of her and Laverne not feeling very well. So let's keep them in our, in our prayers. Uh, so, obviously, these sheets are not here just for us to print. They're here for our use to, to keep in mind uh, those that we need to be praying for. And there's a big list on the back, too, that we generally do not uh, go over. But keep just read through them and, 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 and pray for them all.
I want to remind you too that that our plans right now are beginning August the second to have Bible classes beginning. Uh, we'll have one adult class in here. Just try to keep this area as the area that we need to really clean afterwards the way that we need to, uh, and the kids will uh, have some classes out in the back uh, in, a, in a larger area, spread out. Everybody will hopefully continue to be spread out. Want to do remind you today as you leave to please. Um, uh, keep your keep your distances. The uh, times are still pretty rough on us as far as the deaths and those that are getting the virus. So thank you for being here this morning. Uh, tonight, uh, remember that to to pay attention to the Bible classes and and worship online if you would. Thank you. As we prepare to give this morning and prepare to. To exit, we will say one more prayer, and please, um, as you exit, uh, exit, you can drop those uh, contribution in the boxes in, in the back. Uh, please try to um, at, respect people in their space as you as you do try to leave. Um, we've uh, had some that uh, would like a little more space than others, so just try to kind of be aware of that as you uh, go to exit t uh, this today. Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We thank you for giving of your Son, your Lord. We thank you for what we have in your word. Lord, we thank you for the church. Lord, we thank you for all the spiritual blessings that we have in this life, your Lord. And, your Lord, we, we love being yours. We love being your children, your Lord. And, your Lord, will help us to, to make sure that our lives are living in accordance to you. Lord, as we leave this place today, your Lord, Help us to go into the world and proclaim the gospel in any way that we can. The Lord, to share your word uh, everywhere we go, that others may come to the knowledge of you. The Lord, help us to hold fast and cling to your word, your truth, to your church. The Lord, to let those be the priorities in our life and let those things be the things that, that help us get through every single day. The Lord, help us, dear Lord, in all things, help us to remove fear, help us to, to cling hold to you, Lord, help us to teach. Lord, be with those that are sick at this time, and Lord, help them in their individual uh, circumstances. You may help them to be healed, if it be your will, dear Lord. Lord, those that are grieving the loss of loved ones, dear Lord, help uh, them to have comfort. Dear Lord, help us to be the helping hands and the people that are there to, to help one another, to comfort one another support one another. The Lord, help our world. Help our world to see the Lord that they need you. Lord, the same prayer is offered for our country, for our state, for our city, for just every community and every place in this entire world. That people may see you, dear Lord. You may see you living in us. Lord, God, guard and protect us. Keep us safe as we travel today. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.